Welcome everybody. We're not gonna oops, we're not gonna waste much time to get started here. So hopefully you grabbed your coffee. My name is Jeremy Floyd. I'm one of the co-founders of New Walk It, New Walkie, New Walk It, New Walkie. We have Jen Peed here for People Path. Um, just want to give some context to what we're talking about today. But um, for those of you joining the program, and then for those of you watching the future, uh, the the show, I, there's, I think there's kind of, a, and Jen probably agree with this, there's a lot of far, five alarm fires right now around like the great resignation. And I think it's like ever an article a day around that, maybe a little more than that. Um, if you set your Google alerts to be <laughs> to stuff like that, like I do. Um, but, you know, I'm guessing that there's more nuance than what you're hearing about the great resignation and, and numbers are showing trends, but we're not really here to solve that problem initially today, even though we talk about that stuff a lot. What we want to discuss is kind of, uh, uh, you know, companies are finding considerable gains when attracting talent um, with employee alumni groups. And, um, you know, we're in Milwaukee currently working with a mid-sized company around 1,500 people trying to develop them. And I think the theory is pretty brilliant. It's really about the execution. And we're going to talk about that today. And you know, the the just to put this in perspective, just be the theory of a, an employee alumni group is just because employment is over, doesn't mean that the relationship has to end. And I think that's the most important thing. Is I think most of us, you know, we have the exit interview. That person leaves, and we think, you know, goodbye forever. And that's probably not how should we be. We should be thinking of that. So I was chatting with Jen here, our guest. And just to give a little bit of Jen's background, uh, well, you know, Jen, do you want to give some of your background and I'll kind of fill in some color? How about that? Sure, sounds good. Um, yeah, so I am the uh, VP of uh, customer advocacy at a company called PeoplePath. Uh, and we uh, focus on uh, building corporate alumni programs using our uh, software um, that we build. And uh, we've been doing this for about 15 years. We were a merger between two companies about a year ago. And what I do is I focus on uh, best practices and um, strategic um, initiatives within the company for thinking about this life cycle, this employee life cycle, because we believe that building lifelong relationships is actually the key to uh, the, the foundation of success for, for us and for the clients. Um, I joined them in January, so it's about a year. And the reason I joined them is because I had managed a global alumni program for a um, consulting firm based in New York called Oliver Wyman for about five years. And before that, I had spent a decade in community buildings, mostly in higher education, but also managing Oprah's online communities. So well-versed in, in how online communities are supposed to work. So I brought my expertise and experience with me to PeoplePath and it's been great ever since. Um, cool. And, you know, let's just talk about the theory of these first before we let's let's start way up here and then we'll kind of drill into what everybody does wrong, because that's the best part. <laughs> but like the, the theory of an alumni group for a corporation might sound if you haven't, you know, maybe there's people on the, the call here who haven't um, are not familiar with them, but the theory sounds really good, right? Like it works for universities to for donor engagement and people to be, uh, build uh, you know, give back to the university in many different ways, not just financially, but uh, but then you know, a company seems different, right? Because it's like it's you know, it's more transactional. That most of that camaraderie maybe isn't built after you left, like it is at a university. Um, and companies don't have sports teams and groups <laughs> and stuff like that. But maybe they should. I don't know. But anyway, I guess some of them do. But can you give us like just the theory of these and how they started, maybe? For some yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a pretty simple concept, right? If if anyone's gone to a university, like you mentioned, you are familiar with what it's like to be an alumni there. The difference is your university alumni is always asking you for money for whatever five dollars here, a new building there, right? Like that's what they do. A corporate alumni program does not need you to give money to a, a corporation you spent time at. They find value in other ways. Um, so this started. The concept started roughly in the 90s, um, my CEO actually started the Microsoft Alumni Network in 1995. There might have been another one or two that were around that time, but what we really saw was in the middle of the early aughts in, in like 2005, six, seven, somewhere in there, companies just started really diving into this idea that there's value in letting, in keeping up with your alumni after they've left. 
And it's just that it's just keeping in touch because it's still part of that life cycle, right? You've got to work with recruits. You've got to work with your employees. You've got to work with your alumni and you get different experiences and different value at each stage, but it's still part of that stage. And then what we're seeing now is that people come back, right? So that boomerang hire is such a huge thing, but that's part of that life cycle that they left for a while, but then they came back. And so they're still in that, that routine. And so these programs really help build out those relationships. And, you know, if I'm an employee or an ex-employee, I say, I left the company, why, what, why would I want to do that? You know, I, I could see maybe if they were going to give me a free product or something. Like I used to work for Microsoft. If, like if I could get, well, I don't really need free Excel, but, <laughs> but if there was like, you know, stuff like that, like what would I, what, what would well, be the. Yeah, that's, that's actually how it started. So Microsoft, I know, um, and, and I don't know if they still do this or not, but they did offer every year a free um, office suite. So I think it costs like a hundred bucks to download the entire like office uh, software right so they you'd have to pay to join this because it was outside of microsoft's corporate structure but you'd get that feedback immediately in free software and other perks and we're actually seeing it now we just launched with um starbucks recently and they're offering five dollars to any of their former baristas to come and join the alumni program so sometimes there's incentives but what we really found was a couple of years ago we did research on this because we wanted to know why exactly do people participate and Three years ago, we found that there's four major reasons or motivations for why someone participates. Uh, and it's all what you kind of expect, right? So partially it's career, social, pragmatic, or mission-driven. And so career is what you'd expect. You're just trying to level up. You're trying to make more networking opportunities, things like that. Social is, again, what you'd expect. Just you want to, you know, hang out at happy hours and go to events and conferences and things like that. Mission driven is you really still do identify with the mission of the organization, even though you don't work there anymore, so you still want to be a part of it, help out, more nonprofit based. And then the pragmatic one are those discounts and perks, which we find actually are the, is the least amount of reason why someone does join a, a program, but it's still there. Hmm. So if you're in retail, it's... Why, why it's, do you think that is? Why do you think that's... I, th I think because in the world that we live in in the last five to 10 years, people have moved around jobs so much. We hear about the great resignation, the great reshuffle, whatever you want to call it. But uh, I think because people are moving around so much, they, they realize the value of just keeping that network going. Mm -hmm. And the information that you might get from a former company or former connection is how you find that next opportunity. And so it's just, those are the number one and two reasons typically, but it changes depending on your organization. Yeah, do you feel like that most companies I'm kind of jumping around here, but do you feel like most companies start with like, what can we give them as, as far as like a product or a perk? Is that where everybody usually starts and you have to kind of come back and go, it's not really about that? No, actually, I think it's happening more and more now because people are realizing that incentives help. Um, mm -hmm. But I think actually where companies start is what can you do for me? And I always have to kind yeah. of walk that back is, yes, you're going to get benefits from this. There is a good return on investment. But really what you have to start is what do they want? What do the alumni want? How can we help them? And when you start at a company or start at a program in that way, then you start to think about how do you engage this community? What are you offering them? How much money and budget are you going to set aside for this? And that's when you start to see success because you're framing it as why does someone want to participate and how can we help them? And then eventually you start to see your return on investment just by putting them first. And let's just talk about why, like, there's probably people on the line here that are represent companies that might be thinking about doing this. What is the benefit? Because this isn't short term, right? Like, you don't start one of these and also, wow, the talent is flowing in. And I, I realize sometimes it's hard to think about 10 years down, five years down the line of talent attraction. But then, you know, here we are five years later. And if you didn't think about it now, you, you're in the problem. You probably are. So what? tell, tell me, the, tell the group the benefits of this. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that we've researched over the last uh, seven or eight years is a pretty consistent um, top three goals that, that um, programs have. It's talent acquisition, business development, and brand awareness. And there's a couple of others. Sometimes it's um, corporate social responsibility might pop in there sometimes, but those are the top three that we see always every year consistently. And um, talent acquisition is the one that I like to focus on the most because I think it's the most pressing conversation as far as great resignation. But 
if you started one today, you're not missing out on anything. If anything, you're starting today, it's the best time to start because people are interested in it now. It does take time to build a program. So an online community, no matter what it is, doesn't happen overnight. Um, even if you had a list of your ex-employees, it wouldn't really matter much because that list is probably pretty out of, date, uh, out of date. And so a platform is kind of your minimum requirement for starting a program. And connecting it to your systems is extremely helpful. I've seen programs do it without any kind of integrations or data and software you know, co complexity. What do you, mean, what do you mean by connecting it to your system? Sorry, yeah, good question. So, um, you know, you have information in your HRIS system, like a workday or something like that. And you, that's where you would know that you had 20,000 employees or however many you have. And that last bit of information, you probably are not going to have a personal email address after they've left. So that's what you need to have the program. But when you start to think about the connection of those two things, the HRIS to the platform, it's for anyone who leaves today. So that exit process becomes very, very important in that whole thing. All you need to do is collect a personal email address typically, and then they can be welcomed into that community. It's pretty simplistic, it's, it's automated, um, and that helps you build that community uh, into what you want it to be. Um, you have to go kind of back and find all the old people, that, the older people that have left, which is tough, but it's, it can be done. Um, but connecting the systems help. And so, sorry, do you have a follow-up question? No, go ahead, go ahead. keep going. <laughs> sorry. So um, and then once, once a person learns about the program like anything else, then they kind of get into it. They start in, you know, engaging with other people, with you, with themselves. You have to think about it from a programmatic stance. You need to create engaging content. You need to... Um, create opportunities for them to connect through events, things like that, and um, just make reasons for people to come back throughout their career. Yeah, I think um, when I've talked to a lot of companies about these or getting them off the ground, and what I what I think is this: the first initial thought is that you know, is, is if I the email list is the the alumni, right? Like it, it's treated like if I just send them an email. That that this will be the alumni group, and I think there it's like a you almost have to go through a community manager development with people in a way because this is a community and a community uh, needs something from the employer like I like there's a hundred billion companies that could send me an email right <laughs> like it's not I don't feel like I'm attached to them either way but if mm -hmm. there's someone driving the community and and what if what have you seen or, or, or taken away from the need of a still a person and you know on top of a software from these. yeah absolutely so um a platform i would say is minimum and then it goes hand in hand with needing a full-time person so one of the other things that we've studied is the um growth of that over the last seven or eight years and what we used to see was probably 85 percent of programs would have a full-time person and now we see 98% of programs have a full-time person. So it is a quick thing that has grown and so much so that a full-time person almost isn't enough in some cases. Um, we're seeing now minimum of teams of two or three, depending on the size, right? Like if you have a smaller program, you don't need more than one person. And a lot of times we see people doing split roles, which is also fine, but you need someone who yeah. owns it and can think about all of the engaging pieces throughout the year. Yeah. And what? let's just talk, let's just go, where have you, where are the best, ones like if someone had to do some research on this who, who's doing it really well as far as companies Ooh. and then can you, if any of you know like large medium and maybe even a smaller company too so people can think about different scale yeah um i think uh, as far as a large company goes accenture is doing it really 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 well they're huge they've they've got a lot of um investment in it as far as um, the platform and the team and the opportunities to engage and what they see as a, a good return on investment. Um, they've kind of figured out a lot of those aspects. So they've been around for at least 10 to 15 years. Um, so they've, they've figured it out over time. McKinsey is usually the gold standard in that same way. Um, they do everything in-house. Uh, a smaller firm that I can think of or a company, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think they only have one or 2,000 people total and I think the company's only a thousand people. So it's um, just really well connected, really well done. Um, and so size sometimes can be um, an intimidator for some people, but overall you just work at it, right? So if you start with 
either whether it's 500 or 50,000 alumni, you just chip away at, at all of it, right? The same way, interpersonal connections, really well done events and programming. And over time, you'll get people to come back. Um, let's well, also, if anybody on the line wants to pop in the chat or come off, um, come off mute, you can ask questions anytime, just maybe raise your hand or, or pops up in the chat. Because if you're looking at building one of these right now or, or thinking about it, just let us know. I, um, I, I think let's just go into starting one, right? Like, how, where would you start? Um, you, you, the platform obviously is important, but I imagine you need to get buy-in inside of a company. Where do you, who's usually running these? What department's running these? Because I think, you know, I, I know this is, sounds like a human resource thing, but I could see where that could maybe go wrong too sometimes. Or like, where, yeah. who needs to own this, I guess? Who needs to get yeah. people? It's fascinating because we did some research on this as well, that when you think about the goals, the brand development, the talent acquisition and, and, and uh, business development, <laughs> You'd think brand would be marketing, talent would be HR, and business might be marketing or sales, right? And what we find is actually not that at all. So sometimes if, you're, if your goal is talent acquisition, sometimes you're housed in marketing. If your goal is business development, sometimes you're, you're housed in HR. Like it's really all over the place. Sometimes what happens is companies decide who might be best suited to do a program like this and where the budget is going to sit. A lot of times budget sits in marketing because they have more than... HR. But I would say if you're going to do this smartly, <laughs> you'd want to think about what your goals are first. So if your ultimate goal, and you can have all of these goals, but if your ultimate goal is talent acquisition, then it might want to be in HR. So HR can support you and think about this from a strategic point of view. And that means your CHRO should really be involved. So when it comes to putting one of these programs together, you need your C-level involved. Absolutely. One for buy-in and two for messaging. They need to help you communicate throughout the rest of the company that this thing is important, that it's a strategic initiative, that it's a benefit to people, all of those things. So if you're you know, an entry-level person, a manager, a director, and you're wanting to do one of these programs, you have to get buy-in from a high level to get the budget and, and, and sow those seeds. Um, and I don't know if you're comfortable sharing, but what, you, what have you seen starting budgets for some of this, maybe in a sliding scale? Yeah, no, uh, we've actually did some research on this too. So uh, we have seen everything from $0 up through um, $500,000. So um, the majority of programs have uh, about $100,000 in, bu in budget throughout the year. And that's typically for events. And that was also a little, it was, that was 2021 in our research. But I think that was kind of a holdover from pre-pandemic where I think most people are gonna go virtual now for a lot of their events, which is much cheaper. So uh, I used to do one event in New York every year for our alumni that were all based there, which was about 3000 people. And we'd get maybe 300 people to show up. And that event was $40,000. We would do the same kind of event in San Francisco where that event would cost $5,000. So it just depends on where you're gonna have these. But once we started going virtual, the, most events were not more than 2,000. And that was just because you'd be mailing something to somebody, wine tasting, or a, we did a magic show. Like It was just yeah, yeah. paying for the, the, the time. So it's much cheaper now, I think, to do some virtual events that are actually more connecting in some ways. Um, but you just need to pay for the platform, the, the, the full-time person, and then whatever programming you're going to do throughout the year. Yeah. Do you think... Um, I you know, when, when we're, when you're starting this, I feel like, you know, you have the platform getting people on it. Where have you seen, you know, it's going to be a tough thing. You might not have their personal email address. It's like, how do you build the actual people if you don't have their email addresses anymore? Have you seen somebody do that right and yeah. wrong or we've been the wrong way. Let's just talk about, let's talk about positive. <laughs> let's see, like, where have you seen people like, what's the marketing look like? Because, you, you know, we talk about brand, like there, yeah. there's a lot of marketing to this. So it's not just a, there is people internally. Yeah, it's a, it's a team sport <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You are going to, no matter where you're housed, whether you're in marketing, HR, or whatever, you're going to need all those departments anyway. So you're going to be very cross-functional. Um, the marketing is important because let's say you have 10,000 alumni and you've got email addresses for 3,000 of them. That means there's 7,000 of them out there in the world that you need to find. And Marketing helps with that, right? So social media is a big tool for that when you're posting out into the world, like we've got, we've just launched an alumni program. Like that's how people will find you because it's shared. Um, one of our clients is actually doing some paid media around this. So they're trying to 
just put it out into the world that they they have a program that they want people to come back to. Um, that's not always happening, but I do think it's a best practice to start putting out ads into the world. Um, any kind of press that you could do, right? If you're a big company, sometimes that's not worthy for people. Anything that just catches the eye, but you need marketing's help to do that. Right. What, um, can you maybe share some success stories? So we've, we've built it, we've marketed it, we've got people in it. You know, have you, do you have any data or, or you know, maybe testimonials of people that have said, you know, we've hired more people, we've sold more things or anything like that, because it'd be curious to see, because it is, you know, we can set these up and then if, if we're not getting, because I'm guessing, you know, what, what comes out of these is a lot of referrals, right? If you do these right, like, mm -hmm. and we know mm -hmm. referrals are higher, faster, they cost less than, than recruitment. And you can kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah, what we found is 26% of programs offer a referral fee. So, you know, if you're an employee, you refer somebody, you get a fee for referring them if they get hired. So they extend that to the alumni as well. So it's the same program internally as it is to the alumni. Um, the hard part is, is that we know that these programs are offering it. We do know that there's 74% of people or, yeah, going up, sorry, 74% of people who are, should be offering one of these programs and they just aren't. What happens is the breakdown of how to track those referrals after they've been referred isn't always up to date. So it's actually yeah. something we're thinking about surveying for next year of just, okay, now you've got these programs, what's your success rate look like? And what we do see is they do track boomerangs. So that's the other thing that is not necessarily related to a referral program, but um, is just what happens um, naturally. So at my firm, we just started tracking like what the rehire dates were. And we found that in a given year, between 10 and 20 people would come back every year in senior mm -hmm. positions. So we track all of them, but we really were only mostly concerned about the, the more expensive to hire partner type level. Um, but we, we found 10 to 20 a year, which I forget the number, but it, you know, let's say it was $500,000 in, in recruitment fees a year to look for really senior executive level hires. Um, all of that went away because we just pulled them out of the alumni program. So we weren't really like actively posting anywhere. We just like looked through the alumni program and like realized who we knew and who had connections and started conversations. Hey, would you consider coming back to the firm? It takes a while, but like it happens, right? So all you're then now doing is just dividing the costs of the program and the management. And so therefore your costs per hire is much, much lower. So we have um, uh, another firm that actually has quantified this and they save um, millions of dollars per year on um, boomerang hires from the alumni community. Interesting. Yeah. And, you know, the, I mean, I can, I can just, if these are done really well, you're, when you build strong communities, that stuff happens, right? I think the, the breakdown is always when uh, companies think they have a community, but they run it more like a marketing campaign. And I think what, what you're advocating for and what you've seen as the best success is you treat this like you're most like, like you're, you're building a political community or any, any type of community, right? Let's just be political, yeah. but you know, it's community <laughs> building. It's, it's almost knocking on doors, having those one-to-one -one connections and making sure, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that we always talk about at Milwaukee is like, how do you measure the health of a community? And, you know, some of the stuff we use is like monthly reoccurring relationships. So it's not how much the brand is talking to the individual in the community, it's how much the individuals are talking to each other. And, you know, measuring that is very tough, right? But you know, a good community that's working is when people are meeting and connecting and, you know, building their own type of culture inside that community. Um, and yeah. that happens from connection. So it's, it's a little, I mean, you could probably check with your software, but, um, you know, so, you know, going back to like, yeah, can you can you, oh, sorry, what was that? Someone raised mm -hmm. their hand. Sorry. The question. Penny, mm -hmm. do you have a question? Mm -hmm. uh, Penny. Okay. I'm just going <laughs> to meet if you have a question. <laughs> um, let's talk about like tangible stuff. Like what are these, like when we talked about Accenture doing like doing the, like the gold standard, what are they doing differently um, that someone else isn't doing? I think they invest in it. They see the possibility. They also um, over time have planned it out really well. But one of the things I think is 
truly important is that they allow their employees to be a part of the organization or the alumni community. So that's often a, a topic of conversation is should our employees be involved? Yeah. And it's it's such for me it's such a no-brainer, but sometimes law firms don't like having you know certain levels involved. It's it's a very um, walled off community, which is if that's how you want to run it, that's fine. But what we find is the majority of programs do have their employees in it. And I think that's purely smart on a branding behalf. When you join a company, you're excited to be part of that company. You're not thinking about the day you're going to leave, right? So I used to show up at our new um, training consultant or new consultant training sessions. The day day one or week one, I would show up and be like, hi, I'm the alumni lady. Like, why am I here? And they'd laugh. And then I would tell them about this program, the platform, the features, the, how they can use it. And they're like, oh, like this is actually brilliant, right? Because I can use the directory to find anyone who's going to help me do my job, right? Things like that. So mm -hmm. you work it into this culture right you work it into that we know that you're probably not going to be here for your entire career we want you to be but if you're not you're still a part of the family which i don't love using family as a as a thing but you're still part of the network you're still part of our, our, our world and we want to keep you close and that sets such a nice tone of, of a connected culture and a culture of belonging which is so important in, in this world so once the employees have an understanding that it's there, that they can use it, and then when they do leave, which we all know they're going to, right? Like in our world, no one stays longer than four or five years anymore. Uh, then they get to the exit process and they know exactly what to expect. How do I sign up the alumni program? And so they're more engaged as an alumni. Okay. And the, so when, when people, you know, I, I could see, I could see the, the, you know, even from a, so, you know, one of the things that we've come across is that like 67% of people meet close friends through work, because obviously you spend the most time here. Now, you know, what is the future of that in a hybrid world? I don't really know. I, I mean, I, I imagine companies are either A, going to have to do a better job of connecting people across the company, or, or B, they're going to have to maybe invest more in people's communities so they can build, you know, camaraderie there. But I think the alumni thing is interesting because, you know, I, I can think of all the companies that I have left and still, you know, when I see somebody that I haven't talked to in a while, I connect with them but because we don't have that repetitious interaction anymore. We don't really talk. But if there was a, if there was a, I guess it's like a soft landing after I leave, I can still connect if, if the leaving was like mutual and, you know, it, it, great. I can still see myself engaging with those people because when people leave a company and let's say they leave a big social group and let's say they even move to a new city that life stage change really contributes to a lot of the isolation that we see on the rise everywhere and because of that change it, it could be really lonely in a new city and that's why you, you usually see people in new cities um, find an affinity around other people that are new in the city seems to be a thing that generally happens. Um, so what do you think, Do you? I guess my you know, babbling about statements, but uh, the question and all that is, do you see this helping that at all? Like that kind of, you know, beyond just the corp, the, the transactional benefits of starting one of these is like the, the social benefits of them in a way. Absolutely. I mean, so I was in New York for 16 years. I moved to uh, San Diego just before the pandemic actually. And I was remote with the company and I thought, hey, let's use the network and see who's here. And I was able to find a few people that were here, which was pretty exciting, right? So yeah. it's, it's the directory is by far one of the biggest features. It's usually one of the top five features of, of value to alumni for that reason. I do think that it will play a big role. I also think that as people leave more companies, like I leave a company every few years, I'm sure many on this call have left a few times in their career, you start to rack up former companies. And so it, you have you'll have multiple like communities 16 alumni time. groups. And <laughs> you, you might, honestly. Yeah. So <laughs> I do think that's going to happen more, which is why I think now is a great time to start a program, because you'll you'll kind of get in on an early wave of things. But I think 10 years from now, you'll be in probably four or five different alumni groups um, in your career. Are you seeing, you know, your, I, what's, I mean, I imagine you're seeing a growth just from a, your growth of alumni networks. What are you seeing as growth? Because I'm seeing a lot of, I mean, not, you know, we're in the Midwest. I don't see as much of this as I do in like the coast as like chief community officers and, and these kind of alumni groups. But are you seeing a, a pretty big uptick in people starting these? Yeah, actually, um, we've, 
it's funny because I think in there in your post you posted something like Nike and Google yeah. and I forget the third one but all of those yes they're headquartered in New York but they have offices all around the U.S. Yeah. and the world right but they actually have such um, a need from alumni themselves to do it to, to connect and be part of the an alumni community they actually have all started their own so Nike actually I was just talking to recently they launched this summer um, and they're doing it completely aside from the brand. They're trying to get the brand to help sponsor and be a part of it, but they're doing it on their own and they're doing membership. So it's such an important thing. And especially as people move around, as you kind of just mentioned, right? And then we kind of decentralized from some of the cities. I think this will become much more important. And, you know, my, my program was global. We had 60 cities. So yeah, I was based in New York, but we were in all, all around the world and smaller communities and smaller places, but locally driven. And that it was huge everywhere. So. I feel like every time I'm in a different city and I see somebody that's a Packer or Wisconsin fan, it's like this instant connection. We always seem to find each other too. It's just so, so strange. <laughs> how we, um, oh, yeah. okay. But uh, I think Teresa has a really interesting question here. And this is actually something we should definitely expand upon a little bit. But when starting one of these, like maybe a little bit more logistical type questions. Like what are the values, features, and benefits for most alumni groups? And Teresa, are you talking about the person in the alumni group or the company itself, just to clarify? Basically what is a must to offer? Like you were talking about the director, okay. like what are like the baseline yeah. benefits to them? Absolutely. Um, there, we do a, just as everyone knows too, I'll post this, uh, I'll give this to Jeremy afterwards. We do a, a benchmarking report every year where we ask questions like this and it's all in a five page booklet so you can kind of peruse. But the features that we offer or that alumni find most valuable correlates to their motivation. So if you're career oriented, typically your number one most needed and most wanted feature is a job board. And if you're more social in nature, then a directory is your number one. But typically across the board for all programs, what we see are directories, job board, events, um, and then um, storytelling. So like pages for alumni stories or interviews or things like that. So those are typically the, the biggest features. We're adding more now in for that's more engaging like polling features or um, what else, messenger chat type thing. So you could talk more one-on-one, -on -one. like those are the things we're starting to refine our own platform with just because we're seeing that more as a requirement. Um, but in the last decade, it's really been those top four have been the biggest ones you have to have. Does that uh, answer? Yeah, okay, sorry, that, that's really helpful. Can I ask a follow-up question just in yeah, terms fine. of backing up a bit and going to the foundational parts of this? Like what platforms are you using? Like we were debating a Facebook group Oh, yeah. yeah. Teresa, we'll, we can, let's, let's, you just segue into uh, our kind of a, another where we're going to go next is like, what do people usually get wrong when they start these? And you just hit one on the head. <laughs> so let's talk it's, about a, it. it's, a, it's a great question, though. So groups as a feature of a platform is important. And some companies use them, some companies don't. But when you talk about outside feature outside platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, anything that's socially owned, right? Those are great to have. They are not an alumni program. And the reason for that is one, you don't own any of the data. So it's impossible to tell who is an alumni and who's not, um, unless you do some real digging, which I have done. We had, an alum, we had a LinkedIn group, but it was something I had to check our workplace information to find if they were an alumni or not. And a lot of times people don't come in with their full name. You know, they're Gen P or, you know, Mr. C or whatever, they don't use their full name sometimes on LinkedIn. So that's even harder to, uh, you know, valid, um, uh, find if, if they're actually who they say they are and if they are an alumni. Um, a platform, so typically a platform is a third party that contracts with an organization. So that's what my company does where the company, called, the people, um, <laughs> can't speak today. The platform is called PeoplePath. We have competitors out that are out there. There's probably three or four companies that really, really do this quite well. Um, they give you different things and they'll, they'll give you different aspects of customer service and things like that. But ultimately they offer roughly the same things. Um, some are out of the box and some are not. But what we find is if you're an enterprise company, you do want something that customizes with you because you're gonna need different things. But ultimately you wanna own the data. You wanna own the process. You wanna own the exit process in the sense of like where you send alumni. And if you're sending them to a LinkedIn group, 
there's no features for you to manage that. And not everyone kind of thinks about alumni, like they're on LinkedIn, but they don't go there that often. Whereas a platform you can kind of control because you can email them. So it's fine to have things like groups on LinkedIn and Facebook elsewhere. You're gonna have problems with that only because those platforms are not guaranteed. Like Facebook right now has so many issues that some people aren't on it at all. Um, some people still love it. And so you're gonna get fragmented pieces of your community in those places. So it's better to yeah. own the platform yourself and, and do it and right. I think um, you just hit on a really important point. It's just, you know, what we teach people or companies all the time is about owning your audience. And it doesn't, you know, for, and, and it's not, I don't think it's this it's as transactional as that sounds. It's more about um, Facebook could, Facebook groups can change a hundred times and you have no control over that audience. The LinkedIn groups have changed many times. You know, we used to run a big one for Milwaukee. All the features changed, you know, the way, the, the, you know, the algorithmic ways they can connect people can change and um, then you have no control over that. And then if you want to, uh, and, and, and owned audiences also, you know, you have to pay to, to, to reach those people, you know, an organic post only goes so far. Whereas if it's your platform and you control the connections and the contacts and the way to connect people, you don't have to pay extra for that, right? Like that is, that's your audience. And that's important in marketing. That's important in branding. That's important in recruiting. And, uh, you know, obviously really important, I think, in, in when you're building a community first, you want to yeah. be able to, to talk, commu communicate the community um, yeah. as, as you see fit. And yeah. so um, what other, is that, is that good, Teresa? Do you, um, any other thoughts or? No, that, that was very helpful. Thank you for answering those two questions. Cool. Uh, Jen, what are the, let's just go keep going into what other things that like you see that gets wrong and maybe it puts a setback and maybe it's a good intention because a lot of these things are good intention, right? Like my thing of building a, a community what I would start on Facebook too or LinkedIn and then you even start thinking about it deeper. You're like, well, that could just, that's just another distraction as opposed to what we really want. But what else have you seen out there that has been, you know, a missteps or mistakes? Um, not surveying your alumni, right? So the first thing I tell any client, new client perspective even is ask your alumni what they want, right? So you could build something that you think is amazing because you're an employee of the company and this is what you think you'd want. But until you actually are in the shoes of the alumni who need something else, you might build something amazing and then it's not used, right? So surveys are we've all over surveyed, but even if you get 10% of your alumni to answer a survey before you start building things, you'll get a better like understanding of, of what they're after and what they're hoping to get out of it. And then what you're, what you will feature to them. So like groups, groups are tough because they require so much management, right? And whether it's on LinkedIn or in the platform, it just, do they want it? Do they want a place where they can talk about sports or random things or whatever and if they do that's great but if they don't then don't build it right so there are things that just help you understand um, what they're after and what they're doing and you know what what will inevitably inform you of, of how to go forward and a lot of people don't do it so they get into their launch and it's like a quiet launch sometimes and you're just like well did you do did you ask did you find people did you do you have advocates that you knew of and they don't and so you have to kind of connect with people first it's a very people oriented program you know yeah. Any other questions or thoughts in the group? Otherwise, I can keep rattling off all my thoughts and questions. <laughs> uh, got about five or a couple more minutes. I'm also curious if anyone here, like, are, he, are, are people in the audience, like, looking to start a program? Do they have programs? Have they managed Yeah, maybe pop years? in the chat like, if yeah. you're in one or starting one or doing research right now. probably why you showed up if you are. Um, you can pop that in the chat and we will continue if you want to think about your question or you had one and you forgot it. Um, I, I'm curious about the programmatic side of this. Like obviously Milwaukee builds a lot of experiences for customers and clients and we, we're really into the like, what's that experience that we're offering people to connect and delivering those delivering that promise of engaging people what what have you seen that's worked really well as far as programming like actual yeah. you know i i could I, I could see a lot of people doing workshops but you know for for me i always think like do i want to see a workshop on Microsoft's products, like if I worked at Microsoft, I, I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, no, 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 no. like it can't, it can't be all about them, I guess is where I'm going, right, like what, right. what, yeah. it, what it's, yeah, what have you seen? There's, 
an interesting there's year, a, a successful there's, there's a time and place for that, right? So alumni can also be a really interesting feedback group. So if you have a new feature of a product you have, then invite them to that and be like, oh, we, you know, it's no one's seen this yet. We just want to get your feedback. People love that, right? But other than that, I don't think like, shelling out and selling like your your products or what people want what they want yeah. is like if they're career motivated they want to know like i need help with my resume right i need i might need interviewing skills or i'm trying to level up from being a manager to an executive what does that process look like like helping people manage their their professional development is is usually a pretty big area of, of content um law firms are very big on this because they need continuing um, I think they're called CLEs. They need credits for certain things to continue managing and, and being involved. As a, as a, I don't know much about it, but I know they offer it as like yeah. a big portion of their alumni programs of how to get CLEs and things like that. Um, so education is, is very big. Um, and especially now, if you think about all the training and reskilling and all that stuff that's going on, like an alumni program is perfect for that. Um, and it usually doesn't cost much, but you can get your learning and development team to help build this out too. So uh those things yeah those things are, are what we see as the as, as the biggest part events are the other part of programs right so we used to say that um every office had to do two events per year one content based and one social based and so content would be like a, a, a piece of content that someone wrote and they just would get a discussion group around it kind of like a book club and then the other would be um, social so happy hour or we did go-karting one year wine tasting whatever the hell they wanted to do they could do yeah, yeah. but just something that got people together um, so twice a year, it's, as long as you could kind of plan around it and everyone knew there was going to be an event every September, you start to see people who could show up consistently every year. Interesting. Do you find like, so just, this is just a random question now I'm thinking about it. You know, the affinity groups or ER to play resource groups or, you know, business, whatever, you know, there's different acronyms for each company. Um, mm -hmm. those seem like ways to engage an alumni group, right? Have you seen that happen? Like, I, I think of like yeah. any type of affinity group or business resource group, their goal is, they're usually, I mean, sometimes inappropriately, a ta a, you know, tasked with attracting talent, but, um, you know, maybe they have goals of themselves. Do you, do you see much crossover in those groups yeah. with the alumni groups? Okay. I think it's starting, especially because diversity and inclusion has become such a topic in the last few years. And, these groups are, are usually pretty big and powerful now in, in, in organizations. And so what we see is people who are a part of those groups do leave the company and they still want to be a part of it still. So we're starting to see that those groups are starting to flood into alumni programs as well, because this way they can stay a part of something um, that's important to them with their fellow people. Because we all know these concepts, typically they're in our business group are not just related to the, the company, they're related to the topic. So it's usually applicable anywhere you go. Um, but yeah, we do see that there's a there's an overlap and a connection. And so if those groups are doing events like uh, volunteering is really big. So if we see that they're going to do something, they will invite the alumni to come join them as well. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts or questions? We're kind of running up to the end of this, but I just are any other. Jen, why don't you share in the meantime, any other interesting data that you found that might be beneficial for us? I'm just an analytical. Yeah. Player, so. No, same, I, totally same. So I spend six months every year, like really diving into data. So I actually in the chat just posted a link to our 2021 corporate benchmarking report. So anyone can download that and take a look at all the data. We've been doing this um, every year since 2014. So I think on our website, we go back a couple of years, but most of these have the, the historical data as well. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to invite other people to is we're actually interviewing um, our three of our clients next week um, at, a, at a free webinar. So we, we do a user group meeting every year, which talks about platform products and roadmap and stuff, but we're opening up one session to everyone um, that will talk about just best practices, how they got started, what they use. Like, and the cool thing is um, that the people we have are in different industries. So we have, um, um, we have a person from um, Sidley Austin, which is a law firm. IBM and um, Bechtel, which is a uh, construction corporation. So they all have different goals. They all have different things, but um, I'll put the link in here if anyone wants to sign up for that too. And we'll send these links out in the in a recap email as well too. So, Great. Um, okay. Uh, actually, you know, now I have one more question because I'm kind of curious. You, you talked about the four different kind of personality types in a way. Mm -hmm. Do you have a way to 
because we've been messing around with how people work. Um, so, and you know, from a personality, we could kind of predict um, if people are better working hybrid, remote, or in person, like where they would, you know, find that energy and, and you know, be productive and be successful in that environment. Um, have you found a way to kind of figure out what type of person, maybe assessment based or, you know, maybe some kind of sentiment analysis based inside the software to identify that is like, is this no, person a, not yeah. yet. And the tough part, I would love that. And so if you crack that, nut, let me know, we'll work on <laughs> well, a partner okay. or something. But yeah. the, the hard part about this though, is that when it's, it's, it's not like a personality, right? Where if you're career minded now, you're always career minded. It changes yeah. with your life, right? So like you might be career minded in your twenties because you're still kind of starting out, but you might be more social minded in your thirties and you might be more pragmatic, you know, in your forties or fifties, right? So age has a thing where you are in your career impacts yeah, this. It's so it, 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 so it's, it changes depending on your life changes, right? So you might have an amazing job that you don't need the alumni for for 10 years. Then all of a sudden you start to like itch and want to go somewhere else. And all of a sudden you're going to think about the alumni program. So now you're going to need to come back and you're now more focused on something else. So it's very transactional. And that's part of what we understand. We don't think that people are going to come into these programs every day, all day, like you would on Twitter or LinkedIn or something, but, but it's well, whenever you need it. Like Maybe that's a good question. A final question then. Like what, what is engagement? Like, how, are you seeing, you know, people once a month are getting involved in these? Is it like, what's a pattern of engagement? Um, it depends on your um, input into the system, right? So um, if you're putting engaging things into the system, like if you have an event every single month, then you'll see people show up every single month. If you only do I, something I guess, once a year. Maybe I'll re rephrase that. Are you seeing the people that are in it for the social reason are uh -huh. more engaged than people that are looking, like you said, looking just at a job career page? Yeah, so like I said, we don't, I can't tell you in any of our communities that one person is career minded or social minded. So yeah, I can't yeah, track yeah. like why or how they do anything. But basically the percentage of people who do engage is pretty high if you okay. feed it, right? So like yeah, yeah. I'd say probably 20 to 30% of your alumni community inside the platform that's registered is probably active if your program is engaging to them. So yeah. Cool. Okay, well, if there's not any other questions, we will wrap up. Again, we will send out the recording and we will send out these links in that recording. And um, I thank you everybody for coming in. Jen, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, stay in touch as always. And maybe I'll crack the code on the software. <laughs> so we'll see. Let me know. <laughs> okay, take care. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.